Hello, my name is Mike Geig, and welcome to Exceptions Part 2, which is part of my video series on Windows programming using the C-sharp language. In our previous video, we looked at some pretty introductory stuff about exceptions. Uh, we looked at what happens when we don't catch them. We looked at what happens when we do catch them. We talked about the try, catch, finally, block, and so on. Uh, so now that we kind of have an idea of what exceptions are, I kind of want to dig a little bit deeper and talk more about exceptions and some better ways of using them. The first thing I want to talk about is programming our very own exceptions. Uh, there are, you know, base exceptions that we saw, uh, the input and value exception, the divide by zero exception, and so on. Uh, but we don't have to limit ourselves to just those exceptions. We can program our own exceptions to do all sorts of stuff. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, go ahead and create myself a new exception. So I'm going to come to my project. And I'm going to do add new item. I'm going to pick a class again, and this one is going to we're, we're going to call it uh, no Carl exception. I'm sticking with the whole no names of n nobody named Carl. So again, if your name is Carl and you're watching this, I'm not intentionally picking on you. Uh, it's just the first name that comes to my mind, uh, and that's going to inherit from exception. All right, just like that. So no Carl exception is now an exception, and creating our own exceptions are fairly simple. Uh, I'm going to create my constructor no Carl exception, my empty constructor just like that. And then I'm going to have, oops, public no Carl exception, which is going to bring in a string message, which we're going to pass on to base message, just like that. Oops, just like that. And then we're going to have public no, oh, not that one, no Carl exception. And I'll show you what we're doing with this here in a second string message and exception enter and we're going to call base we're going to pass a message and enter and enter is in case we want to nest exceptions just like that all right that's it that's all we have to do to create our own exception our exception is done now oh, I didn't mean to click that um, now, we could do more stuff with this, but just for a basic exception, we don't have to. Uh, our exception is done. So our no Carl exception works just fine. So let's, uh, let, let's go ahead and come back to our form here, and we'll talk about this a little bit. Now, what we saw before were exceptions being thrown by attempting to divide by zero or by attempting to parse something that can't be parsed. Um, or if we were to say try to connect to a database that wasn't there or whatever, these exceptions come from deeper in the code. They're thrown from deeper in the code. But we as programmers can recognize exceptions in our own program and throw our own exceptions. All right. And let me give you a great example. Uh, in our previous program, we attempted to divide by zero. All right. Well, let's go ahead and try this again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a button and a text box. Uh, where's my text box? Actually, I'll just add two. Okay. So, here we go. Let me make sure I got the right, get get them in the right order. So that's text box two, this is text box one. Okay. I'm not going to rename the button or anything right now. But if I do float uh, num1 equals float dot parse text box one dot text and float num2 equals float dot parse text box 2 dot text and then I say uh, uh, float result equals num1 divided by num2 message box dot show result dot to string all right now like we would expect, all right, or we would expect this program to crash if we had put a, a zero in for num2. We could try it out, so we'll see, we'll do 12 and 2, and we see 6, that's what we expect. But now let me do 12 and 0. Now that's interesting, isn't it? I see the word infinity, all right, infinity. My program did not crash, all right. Division by zero with floats and doubles is completely legal in C-sharp, okay? It's just going to say, hey, 
that's infinity, all right? Because, you know, if you think about any number that allows decimal places, zero could also be like 0 .000, 100 zeros, one. It's not technically zero, it's just really, really close to infinity. Uh, it's a number that's really, really big. And so you can never really be certain that you're dividing by true zero with a float or with a double. So they just say, hey, that's infinity. It could be a number just so small uh, that we can't hold it. Um, so we see this value infinity. But now if I'm programming, I don't exactly want the value infinity in there. Right? I, I want to say, hey, let's not divide by zero. Okay, This can really throw a wrench in some of our some of our calculations. So we can solve this. All right? We can solve this by detecting an error and throwing our own exception. All right? So I'll hit OK. We'll get out of here. So like before, I'm going to put this whole thing in a try-catch block. All right, and we will catch exception ex. And if there's an exception, we will do message box dot show ex dot message, just like that. Okay, and now again we'll run it, and we'll see that if I do five and zero, still no error, still infinity. But now we're set up that we can catch these errors. So now what I want to do is inside my try block here, after I've parsed num one and num two, I want to say if num2 equals 0, throw new divide by 0 exception. How about that? All right. So now we're saying, hey, if our denominator is 0, even though we're using floats and that's allowed, we don't want it. Us as the programmers do not want that in our program. So if this happens, we are going to throw an exception. All right. When we create a new divide by 0 exception and we throw it. You can kind of think of like playing baseball or playing catch, and you're throwing it. It needs to be caught. The second we throw it, the moment we throw it, this code will no longer run, and we go to our catch block. All right? So let's go ahead and try it. So let me do 5 and 0, and I see attempted to divide by 0. All right? Look at that. That's pretty good there. Um, we can even see it operate if I put a breakpoint in here and run it. And I say 5, or 2, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong key, 2 and 0. We hit our breakpoint. I'll step in. I'll see that we are throwing an error, and we come right down to the catch block. These two lines didn't run, and our catch block shows us the message. So we have successfully detected a problem with our code. Okay? All right, so let me clear this out here. All right, I'm going to leave this try catch block with the message box that show in there, uh, and I'm going to remove text box two. And now I'm just going to make this so when the user types in their name, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, output that name in a message box. All right. So I will simply say, um, well, I will say string name equals text box one dot text. And let's say for some reason in our program, uh, some hypothetical reason, we, we will not allow the name Carl. For whatever reason, Carl is not allowed. It's not a name we can have. All right? So I can simply do one of these numbers. I can say, well, first off, my results, I want to do message box that show name. All right? And in here, I'm going to say if name equals, and we'll say Carl. All right, oh, if name equals Carl, throw new no Carl exception. And I can actually pass, well, here, I'll show you if I do pass anything in there and if I don't. So I won't pass anything into there. And I'll run it, and I will type in, first off, my name's Mike. And there we go, that's fine. And now I'm going to type Carl. And we see exception of type, Windows Forms application 1 dot no Carl exception was thrown. We didn't give it a message, so that's the message that we get. All right. Uh, instead, we can say you entered Carl, and that name is not allowed. All right. That's the message we're passing into our exception, so our exception will carry that message with it. And we'll run it again, and this time I'll type Carl, and I will see you entered Carl, and the name is not allowed. All right. So you can see we actually wrote our own exception. And we wrote our own exception, uh, called it, passed a message into it, and threw that exception. All right.
it's not going to be very apparent as to why we do that. Because you might be thinking, hey, uh, can't we just do exception? Watch. If I just take the no Carl out and just throw an exception, let me move this down here, um, you get the same thing. Why did I bother creating my own exception? Right? If we can use the generic exception and function exactly the same way. And I'll cover that here in a couple minutes. So let's close this. All right, now before I get to talking about why we created our own exceptions, I want to talk a little bit about exceptions and scope. All right, uh, we have something very neat now. We have a try catch block, uh, well, with finally, uh, and we have this throw statement. Uh, and what's neat is that while try and catches go together, throws can be anywhere. All right, if I throw an exception inside a try catch block, everything's great. If I throw an exception outside one, we can get a crash. So for instance, if I take this, copy it, and just put it up here, outside of a try catch block, and then run it, you can see just by hitting this button, I crash my program. An exception was thrown and not caught. All right, so scope plays a big deal in this. And we can use this to great effect when we're doing things like data validation, because the layers don't really matter. Okay, so let's go ahead and clear this line. Actually, we're going to clear all this stuff out. And we're going to write a quick uh, quick class here, so I'm going to go and add a new class. All right, I am going to add person, and in this instance, person is just going to have a name. Private string name. All right, uh, public person. Oops, public person. We'll have an empty constructor, which I'll get back to, and public person, uh, which takes string, geez, can't type right now, name, we'll get back to that, and I will do public string name as my get and set, get return name, set name equals value, and I'll come back to this here. All right, and in here, we just call our uh, constructor with empty quotes. And here, we say name equals name. All right, and so we have our, our person class. Uh, that's all well and good. Um, oops, I keep hitting that button to save it because I see those asterisks, but I'm not saving this program. Um, okay, so we've got this. That looks great. I'm going to go ahead and close my no Carl exception. Um, and what I want to say now is that I'm going to create a, an object of this class inside form one, and I'm going to use it. All right. So what I want to do is I'm going to say that the user is going to type in the name and hit the button. The name is going to be put into the person class, and then it's going to be read from the person class and put into a message box. All right. So that's that's how we're going to go here. Uh, and while I'm at it, I'm just going to change this to say input name. There we go. Uh, and now, so okay. So inside this button click event, I only want this object to be usable inside this scope. Uh, normally, I'd want to make it global to the class so it doesn't go out of scope, but I don't really care. This is just a quick demo app. Uh, so I'm going to say person, my person, uh, oops, person equals new person, just like that. And then I'm going to say uh, my person dot name equals text box one dot text. All right, and then I'm going to do message box dot show my person dot name, just like that. Okay, and we'll run it, and I'll type in my name Mike, input name, Mike comes back out after it's been fed into the class. Great. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about data validation. Let's say, again, we don't want the name Carl. Carl is not allowed, okay? Um, we have a couple options, okay? We could, for instance, inside our data validation here, say, oops, say, um, you know, if value equals Carl, you know, uh, value equals, you know, like that, and do that sort of data validation. But that's that that's kind of hokey. That's not great. All right. We could also put a try catch block inside here, but again, 
That's not that's not great. That's not awesome. If for there was a, a specific reason we just could not allow the name Carl in this class, and I know that's a terrible example because why would you ever not want that? But let's say for this reason the person can never be Carl for whatever reason, we might say something along the lines of if value equals Carl, throw new no Carl exception. Uh, Carl is not allowed. All right. Now notice there's no try catch block here. We're simply saying, hey, if the value is Carl, get out of here. I, I, I don't want to be in here. Okay. And this line will never run if the name Carl is entered. So no value will ever be put in there. All right, clear that up. All right. Um, and of course, that means if I run this and I type Carl, I crash my program. Hey, Carl is not allowed. Okay. So what we can do here in form one is now we can sit there and say, oh, well, let's go ahead and say, try catch exception ex. And inside there we'll do message box dot show ex dot message, just like this. And so I can run it and I can say, all right. Well, the name is going to be Carl. Oh, hey, Carl is not allowed. Awesome. The reason I do this here inside the button one click event instead of in my class is because the class should not be responsible for how to show the message. All right? The class should only say, hey, Carl's not allowed, throw an exception. And we will let whoever called my class handle it. All right? person is not responsible for representing errors to the screen. That's whatever is responsible for representing any of the screen. That's the, the graphical user interface. Person does not care about the graphical user interface. Person only cares about person. How things are displayed to the user does not matter. And the cool thing about this is that means I can take my person class and I can inject it into a console application and it still just works. If I had message box code in here, Right? Then if I put it into a console application, it wouldn't work anymore because there, there's no message box in the console application. Right? And it just won't work like that. So this just works better for us. All right? It's better design. Just letting this throw the exception and let whoever catch it. That's also a neat point. We're simply just throwing this exception out in the air. We're just tossing it. And we're just hoping someone catches it. All right. Uh, if a well-designed driver application like this, or if this driver application was well-designed, it would catch that error. And in testing, you would notice that it throws an error, and you'd be prepared to catch it. All right. But let's talk about something else here. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this line, and instead, I'm going to inject Carl directly into my constructor. So I'll run it, and I'll type in Carl here, and I crash my program. All right. I throw an exception to which I didn't catch because the constructor is called outside of that try block. So again, I have to be real careful about where things are placed. All right. So ideally, this class would want to be declared inside here. Of course, that means it won't be usable outside of here. See, it gets real tricky real fast. All right. And you got to pay special attention to where you need to use your objects and how you need to use your objects. All right, so now we have Carl being declared, or the, the class being declared in here, and that's all well and good. Let's talk about something else here. Uh, a lot of times with data validation, we want to say, hey, there has to be a name, okay? No empty strings, okay? And that's easy enough to implement. We can just say, instead of this no Carl, see no Carl, we can just say, hey, um, if it's that, we'll just throw a new exception must enter a name. All right, just like that. There, so now the user has to input a name. They can't leave it blank. Now, uh, maybe you've caught this, maybe you haven't, but let's go ahead and run our program. You can see now our program should be fine. Um, we're going to go back to doing uh, textbox1.text. All right, let's go ahead and try this out. I'm just going to run it, and I'm going to put in Mike. And I'm going to hit input name, and Mike works fine. All right. But if I come back here and I say instead of textbox1.text, I'm going to say my person dot name equals textbox1.text. 
and I go ahead and type Mike and hit input name, my program throws an exception. Must enter a name. Well, I have a name, right? So what's going on here? Why is it telling me that I have to enter a name if I have a name in that text box? Well, let's look at this. Right here, we are creating an object of this class with our null constructor. And what does our null or no argument constructor do? Our no argument constructor passes an empty string into our argumented constructor, which then reads that empty string, puts it into our property, and our property says, hey, you can't have an empty string. Oh, see, now we're learning something here. Okay, we need to follow our own rules yet again. If this is the case, if an empty string is not allowed, then our default can't be an empty string. And sometimes you might say something like default or uh, not entered or something along those lines. All right. I'm a big fan of the idea that if an empty string is not allowed, don't offer a constructor where the user doesn't have to enter a name. Just only offer the constructor where the user has to enter the name. That is not a problem ever again. Which means, of course, we can't do this. They have to put a name in the constructor. It's a couple different schools of thought on that, but that's just my opinion. All right, so let's go ahead and put this back. Uh, so that stops working. All right, so we can kind of see uh, how it, it, it's rather important to put thought into how our constructors are formed, uh, put thought into how our exceptions are thrown in data validation, if we want to throw exceptions at all. Sometimes there might be data that we're not pleased with, but we're not specifically going to stop. All right, And you have to pay special attention to how objects are declared uh, and initialized, where they're initialized, um, and where you plan on using them, how you plan on using them. So exception handling is a rather deep topic that we're sort of gleaning the surface of here, but I hope you're getting the idea of, of exactly how to use it. All right. So one more thing I want to talk about in this video uh, is uh, why we would use specific exceptions. I asked you before, you know, when we had that no Carl exception or just the generic exception, or we also have the divide by zero exception. We have the we have all these different exceptions. All right. So the question becomes, why do we have so many exceptions? All right. Uh, why doesn't everything just use the base exception? All right, and there's a very important reason. It's very important to understand why that is. Essentially, not all exceptions are created equal. And by that I mean not all exceptions uh, are the same level of error. For instance, all right, let's say I had um, a program that uh, read in some personal information and put it in a database. Okay, And let's say there's two potential exceptions that could come out of here. One is that the personal information might have been spelled wrong. And two is that the database is not found. Okay, Now, if I just generically caught those exceptions and put them into a message box like this and popped it up to the user, um, that's not exactly going to help. All right. So for instance, um, if the user types in their name wrong, all right, then yes, a message box saying, hey, your name was typed in wrong, uh, you might want to fix that. That's a great message. The user can go, oh, okay, yeah, I, I typed in my name wrong. Awesome. All right. However, if a user types in their information, they hit submit, and it says, warning, database is not found. Well, the user is going to think, okay, what does that mean? All right. I don't know what a database is, or I don't know where the database is, or, you know, what am I supposed to do about that? All right. And then if it just comes right back to the option to keep typing, they're going to be very confused about what's going on. They're going to become very nervous that the data they're typing in might get lost uh, or stolen even, right? Um, and so they're going to start, you know, doubting the quality of your software. We certainly don't want that, all right? So what you might want to do as a developer in this situation is, hey, if they enter in their information wrong, just pop an exception, let them do it again. But if the database is missing or corrupt, let's get out of this program, all right? Just send them a message like, whoa, something really bad happened, contact technical support, and let's get out of this program before anything terrible happens. All right. So you can see two different exceptions, two different ways of handling it. One catch block won't solve the problem. Now, we're not going to be able to do anything with that severe with databases, but we can simulate it. We can simulate certain levels of exceptions here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
uh, I'll just remove the code that's inside this try catch block. All right, we're going to go back to our division problem. So we got a text box one. I'm going to add a text box two. All right. And we're going to say one of two things. All right. Uh, we're, we're pretending that even though the user is the one typing in this data, we're going to pretend we're reading this from a database or a file. All right. So let's pretend there's no user like directly watching um, or maybe just monitoring, but not actually like interacting, even though they will be. We're just going to pretend we're going to use our imaginations. All right. And I'm going to say uh, int num1 equals int 32 dot parse. All right. Text box one dot text and then I will say and actually I'm just gonna save myself some typing num2 equals text box two dot text and then I will say um, int result equals num1 divided by my num2 and message box dot show uh, result dot two string all right and then we have this catch exception, and I'm going to show you how this can be used to actually make our programs better. Uh, so I'm going to do ex.message, just like this. All right. And so what I'm going to do now is I'll run this. Let's pretend, hey, I don't know what kind of exceptions this can cause. So let's go ahead and run this, and I'll be like, let's try to break, break my program. So let's do, I know you can't divide by zero, uh, and so input name. Uh, attempted to divide by zero. Okay, so we have a division by zero exception. All right, uh, or I could do um, ex dot two string to see the name of the exception. Five zero. There we go. And so we've got a divide by zero exception. That's the name right there. All right, divide by zero exception. Okay, great. Even it tells me about line and stuff like that. That's useful. All right, so I know I need to catch a divide by zero exception. I'll show you a couple things here. Uh, so if I go divide by zero, and I sometimes will go uh, like z e x for zero exception. Uh, and so let's talk about what we're going to do if we have a divide. There's a red line here. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so if there's, a, let's pretend in my program, if there's a divide by zero exception, we just want to let the user know about it. All right, so like we've just been doing, zex dot message. All right, uh, the problem is this: is this catch block catches all exceptions, which means this catch block will never run. Just like an if statement, if the first one is true, the ones after that will never run. Um, that's why that red line was there. I was going to show you by running it, but instead I'll just tell you. Uh, so if we were actually to do this, I would want to put the more specific ones at the top and the more generic ones blow it and say no more red line. That works just fine. All right. And so now I'll run it, you know, again, divide by zero exception. We see attempted to divide by zero. Okay. Let's try to break it a different way. Let's instead uh, say T instead of a number. Well, that's a new one. Format exception. Input string was not in the correct format. So we need another catch block for our format exception. Catch. Oops. Format exception, FEX. Now, if a format exception occurs, we want to leave. Something is wrong on our data stream. We're not dealing with numbers anymore. We're somehow dealing with, with words, and we just, let's just get out of here. I'm going to do this dot close. Uh, there we go. If, if that happens, uh, we might, actually, and we might do... Um, Message box dot show, uh, and let's do um, the problem occurred uh, with our data stream. Format like this, and then do uh, fex dot message, just like this, and then we're just going to close and get out of there. All right, and then this last now we have two specific exceptions, and this exception here, our generic exception is to say um, uh, something we did not expect occurred. It just occurs to me that I don't know how to spell occur. 
That's spelled wrong. Don't make fun of me. Okay. Uh, and so now, and we'll output what that is. So now we have three types of exceptions, and this is much, much better. This is really the way we want to write our applications. All right, we can use a generic during testing to figure out what all the exceptions are, but you really should catch individual exceptions, um, like our no corals and our divide by zeros and stuff like that, so you can do very specific things. You don't treat uh, an invalid name exception, right, like a format exception, the same way you treat a, a system catastrophic failure, all right? They obviously have two different levels of severity, and you don't want to lump them together with just outputting a message box to the user. You want to do very specific things, all right? So let's go ahead and run it. And I see that if I attempt to, to do everything normally, you know, that works just fine. If I attempt to divide by zero, I attempt to divide by zero. Whoops, okay, I don't want to do that. But now I'm going to say something and now I get oh hey a problem occurred with our data stream input string was not in the correct format that sounds pretty severe I'm gonna hit okay we're just gonna get out of the program all right so we've managed to treat it two different ways uh, in with the same try block in the same area right and this can happen on a bunch of different levels so for instance let's say I was deep in nested functions I was I was three layers deep and I had an, an error and my error was uh, I was catching errors and I might have like uh, oh hey if this is an error I can resolve on this level like a improper format stream I'll just resolve it right here but if it's something more severe than that I'm not going to catch it at all and let it come up a couple layers to another catch block that might you know be waiting for it we can nest our ca uh, try catch blocks like that and actually while I'm at it while I'm here I'll show you let's go ahead and write a new function let's do private void attempt math that's not a great name but that's what we're gonna call it attempt math and inside here I'm actually just gonna copy a lot of this here. I'm going to paste it inside here. Let's let's get rid of some of this stuff. We're going to get rid of this. We're going to get rid of all the actual work, uh, and we'll leave this generic exception here uh, and and whatnot. Okay. Uh, so all we're going to do is we are going to attempt math in inside here. All right. So inside this try block, we're just going to attempt math, uh, and then we're going to have our catch blocks in here. We are only going to catch divide by zero errors. Those are the only errors I can resolve at this scope, at this level, or that I want to in this program. All right. So we have a try catch block nested through here in another try catch block. All right. And so now let's see this here. I'll put a couple breakpoints in. One inside our button click event, and one inside here to see where our errors actually happen. So I'll attempt to divide by zero, five divided by zero, all right? And so we catch this exception down here inside of our attempt math inside our divide by zero exception block, all right? I'll hit play again, okay. But now let's say I have a more severe error. There's a string in there. I'll click the button. And notice we don't hit this catch block down here. We threw an exception. This catch block was like, I only catch divide by zero exceptions. I don't catch anything else. I can't handle this. So immediately our code leaves this block here, comes up to this catch block, and we say, oh, hey, I catch that exception. Let me, let me handle it here. And we can do that across however many layers. Let's say we had seven potential exceptions. We could have seven layers, which each layer catching one of those exceptions. It's not necessarily a great way to do it, but you certainly could. Okay, uh, so... There's a lot of lot of information here. Uh, I know I'm only kind of scratching the surface with exceptions, but hopefully I cleared some things up and showed you some neat stuff uh, and uh, and made exceptions a little bit easier. All right. So in this video, we talked about writing our own exceptions. All right, which in and of themselves is not all that useful until you get into catching specific exceptions. Then it becomes incredibly useful because you can write your own exceptions to be caught. All right, as like writing your own flags. So we we covered writing our own exceptions. We covered the throw keyword, what it means to throw an exception. If we detect one that's not necessarily an exception, it's going to crash the program, but we want to make it an exception, we can throw, we can detect a situation and throw our own exceptions. Um, we talked about the scope of exceptions, right? Nesting uh, ex uh, exceptions inside or try catch blocks inside of each other, uh, and how exceptions will jump across scope, uh, like, kind of like throwing a ball in the air. And if no one catches it, the game is over because your system crashes. You're hoping someone will catch it, right? You just sort of throw it. All right. And then finally, we talked a little bit about a design issue uh, of using the generic exception and why it's important to have specific exceptions.